Um, thank you all so much for coming out this evening. Welcome to the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. My name is Lauren Willis. I work here in the Education and the Exhibits Department. Um, have any of you not yet had a chance to see the Racing to Change exhibit? Okay, a few. Um, I do encourage you to go and check that out after this evening's talk. The museum is now open until 8 p.m. on Thursdays, so you'll have a little bit of time afterwards to go and see that if you haven't already. Um, and tonight is also your last chance to see the original Oregon State Constitution, um, the handwritten constitution that's on display as well. Um, it is um, right on the, in between the Racing to Change exhibit and uh, the display about the Western Valley. So there's a case right there that has that on display. Um, and it also um, explains a little bit about the black exclusion laws um, that are part of Oregon's infamous history. So now I have the immense pleasure um, of introducing our speaker for this evening, Gwen Carr who I was able to work with throughout the development of the Racing to Change exhibit, um, along with Willie Richardson and other members of the Oregon Black Pioneers. And working with them has been such a joy, let me tell you. Um, it was fantastic. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Gwen was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and attended college at California Lutheran University and Long Beach State University. She moved to Oregon in 1980. And since retiring in 2003, Gwen has been able to pursue her passion for history um, by learning and educating others about Oregon's rich black history. Gwen is currently secretary of the board of the Oregon, State, or Oregon Black Pioneers and serves on the programming committee. In her role, she develops exhibits, such as Racing to Change, which you can see after this evening's talk, displays and publications, and also makes presentations to schools, colleges, historical societies, and civic organizations. Gwen served as the project manager for the Oregon Black Pioneers book on black history in Marion and Polk counties, entitled Perseverance, A History of African Americans in Marion and Polk County, Oregon. Please join me in welcoming Gwen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I think I'm going to leave this on the stand. I'll just try to speak loudly to make sure you can still hear me. Well, thank you for coming tonight to uh, hear me talk about Oregon's early black history. Uh, I usually begin by saying, for some people, it's a surprise that there's anything to talk about. Uh -huh. Because when you say Oregon black history, it's usually, it, it, uh, there's a blank. People don't know anything about it. They don't think there was any of it. Um, but I'm hoping by the end of tonight, you will have learned some things and that you'll also be curious because there's a lot that uh, I don't have time to talk about. And there's a lot of things that we're still learning and we're researching. And so we do these kinds of things really with your help. It's not like you can go right to the library or you Google Oregon Black History and a whole bunch of stuff comes up. You know, you really have to dig, and it's really through efforts of people like yourself, just individual people, that sometimes we find just very important pieces of Oregon's black history. So I would just encourage you to think about your own family history. When did they come to Oregon? How, you know, what was the path? Who lived near them? You know, things like that, because all of those are bits and pieces that we can sometimes put together. To me, it's kind of like a, working on a jigsaw puzzle, where you've got these little pieces, and maybe this piece doesn't mean very much right now, but if you put it off to the side, a little later on something happens, and you say, hey, wait a minute, that connects with that. So it's very important. Just a word about the Oregon Black Pioneers. We're an organization that has been around for 25 years, we just celebrated our 25th year. And I would say probably in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we have really moved in a direction uh, that has enabled us to learn much, much more about Oregon's black history than when we first began. And we've done some great uh, exhibits, and I, I say that 
uh, because they were great for us. I mean, we think they were great, people think they were great too. Uh, this one, Racing to Change, is just the latest one that we have done. Uh, we did one called Perseverance, it's kind of an overall picture of early black uh, history in Oregon. And then the next one was called All Aboard, and it had to do with really the history of the black uh, blacks who came to Oregon to work on the railroad, primarily as kind of a Portland story. And the community that grew up around Union Station as a result of bringing in those black workers. The next one was called uh, Community on the Move. And it looked at that history surrounding the shipyards, the Kaiser shipyards, Vanport, the Vanport flood, and the movement of blacks out of Vanport into Portland and all that that meant. And so um, then we went to Racing to Change. So you can see we're kind of coming up chronologically forward. And when we were talking about what the next era would be, well, um, I was just happy that it was the 60s and 70s because I sort of came of age during that time. I was in college, and so a lot of the stories that we told in Portland as part of Racing to Change, and also here in Eugene, I really, really resonate with because I lived through that. I might not have been in Oregon, but I was a young person dealing with those same type of issues at that time. So I was very proud of what we did there. And also very proud of what we did here with the Eugene story. And I have to say, in the beginning, I really didn't know what to expect. When the museum first approached us about bringing racing to change here, with the caveat that they wanted the Eugene story told, I didn't know a lot about what the Eugene story was. So it was kind of interesting, but I thought, oh yeah, we can do that, you know. How big could it be? Well, it got to be really big. Bigger than we thought, and frankly, bigger than what we could tell, even in Racing to Change. And so I hope that you'll find it interesting as well. But tonight I'm not going to talk about the near history. I want to go way back in time and talk about some of that early Oregon history. And to me, that's more interesting than the stuff that we always talk about, you know, Van Port and things like that. So we're going to talk about early black history. Um, Another thing I want to say, I, I touched on it, when it gets to research, it gets to how you do research on Oregon black history, or any African American history of this country, it gets very complicated. Uh, because it wasn't always well documented, for example. And so you've got to pull out all your resources to really dig and find it. So some of the examples that uh, we use are census records for example, because you can look on the census record and they had a, uh, back in, even in the like 1860 census and what have you, there was a column that said race. And so you could look for B for black or M for, uh, they didn't call it mixed, then it was mulatto was the term that was used at the time. And so that means you have people that have to really go to the library and sit there and look page after page looking for that it, looking in that race column, looking for those black pioneers. Another place that we find very helpful are obituaries, because a lot of that information about these people is contained in their obituaries or in newspaper articles, in family diaries, even in pictures. We have uh, research files at the office, and sometimes we have a picture and we don't know the person's name. That picture might have uh, gotten into the hands of historical society, for example, and they know approximately where it was taken or what year it was taken, but they have no idea who the person is. And so we've established some files that are not really by name, as you would generally think, but sometimes by place. Like I have Champui Man, is what I, I call him. And we know that he was a part of that whole Champui uh, um, delegation that met when they were trying to figure out what they were going to do with the, with the Oregon laws and getting established as a state and that kind of thing. We don't know who this man is. And from time to time, we'll drag out these pictures and make them a part of exhibits, and we'll say something like, do you know who this is? And we're hoping that if we do that often enough, or if we start putting on our website, people will say, oh, that's my great-great-grandfather, or I remember that guy, you know. And so, you know, like I said, it's bits and pieces. It's putting puzzles together. I also have to say that we found 
special collections at college is very important to us too. We found that there's been a lot written about Oregon Black Pioneers. And you wouldn't think that until you start digging for it. And then you read these beautiful master's thesis and doctoral pieces that were written about some of these pioneers or about the, the time in which they lived. So that's been very helpful to us as well. Perhaps the best story, though, that I can tell you about uh, something that was very helpful for us, particularly in producing our first book, Perseverance, was there is a pioneer cemetery in uh, Salem, Salem Pioneer Cemetery, right on Commercial Street. Some of you may know where that is. And we found out that there are over 40 black pioneers buried in that cemetery. And so, of course, your first question, which was probably my first question, is how do we know that? Well, first of all, one of the people who's instrumental in that organization called Friends of the Pioneers, she said, well, we know about every single person that's buried there. We've done research on them. And if you go on their website, uh, you can actually go by category and you can look at, let's say you can search and say, I want to see all the women that are buried in this cemetery. It'll drop down a list of all the women. I want to see all the African Americans that are buried in the cemetery. It'll drop down a list of all of them. And if you click on the individual names, a data page will come up and it will tell you everything that they have found about this person. Sometimes it's a little and sometimes it's a lot. But just the fact that we know that there's over 40 buried there, and maybe we uh, sort of got, um, what you call it, I, I guess. I thought initially, oh, this is going to be easy. We'll just get a list of all the all the cemeteries and we'll just <laughs> check them out and then we'll know who these people are. No. I found that's a real rarity, you know, so to have an organization that has done that was very helpful for us. But normally you have to know the name of the person that's buried in that cemetery before you can get any additional information on them. So we learned a little, little lesson there. So, enough about process and what have you. Let's get on with the story now. Okay. So, in order to start talking about black history in Oregon, we go all the way back to the 1700s. And some uh, academics would say that it probably goes back farther than that because you might recall that in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, there was a lot of exploration going on on the coast. California, Oregon, Washington, or Oregon Territory, basically. And on these ships that came from a variety of countries, they usually had multicultural crews, which frankly I hadn't ever thought about like that. But when you start reading back about these ships that came, and you find out where these, the crew was from, they're from all over the world. And so it's likely that these crews had Africans aboard these ships, but we just don't know who they were. The one, the earliest one, though, that we do know who he is, happened in 1788. And it was a man named Marcus Lopez. And you see Marcus's na name spelled in a variety of ways. It's just happened on this particular slide. It's spelled in this way. But we find through a diary that the, the one of the ship's crewmen kept, uh, we know his name. We know that he came from the Cape Verde Islands, which is on the coast of Africa. We know what jobs he did on board. And we even know that he put in with this ship. It was the Lady Washington, which was captained by Robert Gray in 1788 in Tillamook, Oregon. We even know that on this August day, uh, when they put in there, uh, eventually they got into a little altercation with the natives that were there. And one of the crewmen was killed. And I say that because I want to introduce you to this, which is a historical marker. Uh, it's actually a new marker. The old marker told the story of Lady Washington when it put in there at Tillamook and it named the captain and what have you. And then there was one line that said, and one crewman was killed in this altercation with the Native Americans that were there. Well, I happen to know, because we have been doing research, that that one crewman was Marcus Lopez. And so I was able then to call the people who were responsible for these historical signs and said, hey, you know, this is a really important part of Oregon black history. It would be great to revise that sign to reflect that. So 
so that people know what happened here and how important this is. Because nine times out of ten, if you say uh, that there were black people in Oregon in the 1700s, they wouldn't believe you, right? Okay. So uh, I went to a couple of meetings. We presented the evidence and all this, and they were like, "Okay, yeah, that sounds fine." Uh, but we got to put you in the queue because we're responsible for signs all over the state of Oregon. And so eventually we will make that change. Well, I was happy with that. But just a few months later, as luck would have it, there was a terrible windstorm. <laughs> <laughs> this is no kidding. <laughs> I get a phone call. Uh, Ms. Carr, let me tell you what has happened. There's been a terrible windstorm in Tillamook, and it blew that sign down. And so now, because part of what we're charged with doing is replacing those signs as a priority when they've been damaged or, you know, destroyed, that kind of thing. So now you are really up to the front of that queue. <laughs> and so uh, they really teased me about that because they said, now are you sure you didn't go over there like a backward truck into it or something? So I said, no, it was, it was an act of God. <laughs> the will of God that that story be told. So if you're ever over there on the, um, in the Tillamook area, what is that, Highway 101, I think, right, right along the, the coast there, you'll see this sign. And if you read carefully now, you'll see Marcus Lopez is mentioned there and what happened. So that's really the beginning, kind of the, if nothing else, the ceremonial beginning of Oregon Black History, 1788, first documented the earliest documented instance we have of a person of African descent being in Oregon. So it's a story you'll remember, I'm guessing, too. Okay, so we have Marcus Lopez in 1788. Now, probably a person that everybody, almost everybody, is becoming more and more aware of is the presence of York, who was along on the Lewis and Clark expedition in the 1800s, early 1800s. I'm happy to say that now because I travel around to a lot of schools, even elementary schools, where we're learning black history and that kind of thing, if I say, do you know the name of the black man that was with Lewis and Clark? They're able to say, York. The hands go up. Now that has really changed, even since I've been doing it, which has been 10, 15 years, because in the beginning, nobody <coughs> even knew he existed. And I say that facetiously, because historians knew he existed. But he was not part of kind of the normal narrative that you hear that's told about Lewis and Clark. Then again, neither was Sacagawea. Okay, and so now we're getting kind of a fuller picture of what that crew looked like, you know, they came across together. Uh, certain privileges that they were given that were unheard of at the time. He started out as a slave, but he became, he was Clark's slave, but he became very influential in that. Uh, expedition because he was able to uh, learn things very quickly and he was a real curiosity to the Native Americans that they came across because a lot of them had never seen a black man before and so it kind of helped the situation some, helped to diffuse what might have been kind of an ugly situation in some cases. Uh, so he became a bit of a curiosity and because he kind of played off of that he was able to, you know, um, be the kind of person that was along on this expedition, the kind of person that you needed. He also had great rifle skills and things like that. So he was an intricate part of that Lewis and Clark expedition. So we have York. Now, I'm showing you this picture because I think it illustrates that there's a good possibility that there were other black men in the early years of Oregon, but they've kind of gotten lost in the translation, so to speak. This is a uh, movie poster for a 1950s movie called Tomahawk. And I had never heard of it. But earlier today, I was at a retirement center not far from here. And, and the people was like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> you know, they're like in their 80s and 90s. <laughs> but they were so excited that they remembered that movie. Anyway. Um, the reason I'm showing it to you, though, is because the man in the middle there that's holding the reins is an actor named Jack Oakey, and he is portraying a man named Jim Beckworth. Now, you would think if you just saw the movie, you, it would never occur to you that Jim Beckworth was a black man, right? Mm -hmm. However, here is Jim Beckworth. 
and he was very uh, knowledgeable. He was very well known. Uh, like a Kit Carson, a Jim Bridger, uh, these were his contemporaries. And so when you read in some of their writings, particularly Bridger, talks about Jim Beckworth. Uh, he was among the, the men who at that time, they called them mountain men. And if you've seen, uh, I might be dating myself, but like Jeremiah Johnson, you know, they sort of flee the city and they go and they trap and do things like that. Well, he was really one of them. Um, he became well known as a, a, a trailblazer in the, you know, in the original sense. And in fact, uh, there's a pass named for him in Northern California, Beckworth Pass. It's in the Sierra Nevadas. I'm not sure exactly where, but if you ever come across it, just note that that is a black man. And this, this kind of activity happened in the early 1800s. So it was somewhere after Lewis and Clark, which was, you know, roughly 1803 to 1805. Uh, so it would be like 1812, you know, right in the teens is when these guys were roaming around Oregon Territory. Another thing that was going on at that same time is that you had these same men who were developing what would become the Oregon Trail, the Applegate Trail, the California Cutoff. And this is kind of the illustration of how those those early trails come together. What is in red is what we traditionally think of as the Oregon Trail. And most of these wagon trains started in Independence, Missouri, but there was more than just the Oregon Trail going on at that time as a way for people to get uh, to the West Coast. One of them was called the California Cutoff. And so if you see that yellow sign, you can see that it intersects with the red, with the red uh, coloring. If you wanted to go to California, for example, you took that California cutoff. So you might be on the Oregon Trail for a while, and then you start heading south. That trail ends in Sacramento. If you wanted to take another trail into Oregon, not take the northern route, but take a southern route, you would stay on the Oregon Trail for a little while, and then take that California cutoff, and then you see in the blue, it starts going into northern Nevada, northern California, and then it pretty much parallels I-5. So I remember now having seen the Applegate Trail signs along I-5, and now I get what that is. That's the same as this. Okay, follows that. Well, the story here is that that trail really begins in Rick Rail. Anybody know where Rick Rail is? It's out from out from Salem, just uh, what would that be? west of Salem. <clears throat> and if you go to the Polk County Museum there, in the front is a kiosk which describes Jesse Applegate and his brother, um, what's his name now? Charles. Charles Lindsay. Lindsay is who I'm thinking of, right. It tells their story and their friends who went along with them on this journey that became the Applegate Trail. It's named for Jesse Applegate and his brothers, however. There was a black man along with them named Moses Harris. And you read about him from time to time as well. So that's why I'm showing this, because again, you see how black history is kind of interwoven, but sort of masked with some other things as we go along? OK. Now we're going to start to talk about the ugly stuff. We're going to start with that, and, but I'm going to bring you back. Okay. During this time in our country, uh, as we were moving west and organizing as states, territories, provisional governments, and what have you. Um, this was the same time that slavery was going on in the United States. And so you had opportunities there to make some decisions about who, who you, God bless you. <laughs> so there were choices to be made. Were you going to be a, a free state or a slave state? Were you going to allow blacks in or blacks out? And so what we have is the equivalent of what I call anti-slavery. This is Oregon saying, we're going to be a free state. But oh, by the way, anti-black. We do not want black people here. And if they're here, we want them to leave. And if they're here, we don't want them to own property. Uh, you know, we want to discourage them from coming. And if they somehow get here, we want them to leave. And so there's a succession of what's called black exclusion laws. And it happens and comes on and off the books in the legal system 
in Oregon for many years. The earliest one starting in 1844, when there was a provisional government where slavery is declared illegal, but black exclusion laws are put into place. Now, in order to kind of understand the backdrop of this, you have to understand that a lot of those early white pioneers that came to Oregon were not these big plantation owners. The only way I can explain it in understanding uh, slavery in Oregon is that, you know, we tend to think when you say there was slavery in Oregon in spite of uh, laws, we kind of want to think about the big plantation owner. Kinda, I call it the, the gone with the wind syndrome. So you didn't have these big, uh, prosperous plantation owners that were leaving Mississippi and Alabama to come to Oregon with their slaves. You had four white farmers, some that had a slave, or just a few slaves that they brought with them in spite of these laws. Now eventually, of course, if you, if you follow Oregon politics, it was as crazy then as it is now. <laughs> there was all this fighting about do we have slaves here or not. It's been that way from the beginning. And so you have this conflict of those who really didn't want to be a part of that institution that they had left, mostly because they weren't really prospering in that institution. Okay, But you also had some that said, we have opportunity here. We're going to this new land. We don't want blacks coming here to kind of clogging up, you know, making a mess of this whole thing. We want this to be basically a white homeland. Now, I know that scares a lot of people when I say that, but that's essentially what the idea was, you know. So that is why you had this, these conflicting laws of Oregon being a free state on the one hand, but also saying we don't want black people here. And it happened several other times. Like I said, these laws came on and off the books along with consequences. You hear about the Lash Law, that if you were found to be in Oregon, basically black in Oregon, um, you received so many lashes if you, uh, if you didn't leave within so many days. That was called the Lash Law. There are several other laws like this. If you were an employer and you had hired a black person, you could lose your business if you hired a, a black person to work for you. So there was a, just a variation of these kind of black exclusion laws really meant to discourage black people from being here legally. So that by February 1859, uh, we become a state and we adopt a constitution that includes exclusion laws. So now you see why that happened because it started a long time ago. And after all of the fighting that went on back and forth, um, Oregon was very eager to become a state for a lot of different reasons. And so this is how, you know, that's the reality of what happened. So you might want to, when you do go in there and look at the Constitution and get a better picture of what the voting was like and what those laws were like, it's a very interesting part. I will say there are other states that had similar uh, fights, in fighting about exclusion, whether it was black people or Asians or um, uh, people who were non-white, put it like that. And so I don't know enough about their history to be able to make fair comparisons, but I do know what happened here in Oregon. Uh, a good place, if you're really interested in reading about the whole Oregon slavery issue, uh, this is a book called Breaking Chains, and it was written by a guy named Greg Noakes, who's a wonderful researcher and writer. And he uses several legal cases that involve slavery in Oregon to really look at the broader picture of slavery in Oregon. It's called Breaking Chains. And it's the only book that I know of that focuses solely on slavery in Oregon. But like I said, if, you, if you're going to read it, don't expect the, the um, Gone with the Wind style. It's a whole different thing, but it will give you a lot of insight into why things happened as they did. So, we have these laws that come on the books then that say you can't be black in Oregon. In spite of these laws, uh, we only know of one case where a black man was legally expelled from the state. And that happened in 1851. The man's name was Jacob Vanderpool. And at the time, Jacob Vanderpool owned the boarding house in Oregon City. We know where it was, we know the kind of activity he had going on there, 
And I think, in the back of my mind, that the man who turned him in, because this went to trial, the man who turned him in, I think he was more interested in him as a competitor, because this guy who turned him in also had a business down the road from him, okay? So he basically said, wait a minute, this guy is here illegally. Let's get rid of him. And so that's exactly what happened. The trial didn't take long. It just took a couple of days, really, and it was over. And Jacob Vanderpool was expelled. But this is a kind of a good example of bits and pieces of information. This was an ad that he had for his business that was in the Oregon Statesman in 1851. There was at least two other cases where there were attempts to expel blacks from Oregon during this time period. Uh, they both were out of Portland, and both of them had situations where their white neighbors came to their defense and signed petitions so that they could be they could remain here as an exception to those laws. And as far as we know, those are the three cases where it went to the courts. Okay, I'm going to tell you about some of these people that are on this map. This map was really put together to kind of illustrate the presence of blacks all over the state during this time period, beginning with 1788 and coming forward. And as you can see, uh, just by those pictures, and, and there, we use these pictures in places on purpose because most time when people think about blacks in Oregon, they think about Portland, or they might think about Salem, or they might even think about Eugene. But they don't think about places like Baker City or Canyonville or, you know, places like that. And so this is meant to illustrate that we have found people that live in places all across the state during this time period. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of them. Uh, because remember, they are here in spite of these laws. Okay? They're here in spite of the fact that although Oregon is a free state, Slavery is also present here. This woman is named Rose Jackson. Rose came over the Oregon Trail in a box. And that's a very provocative statement meant to get your attention. <laughs> but it's true. We know that this is true because her master at the time was a doctor who ends up in the Oregon City area and he kept a diary. And the reason, his reason for keeping her in this box, it had holes in it, and they would keep her as they travel along the trail during the day, and when they stopped uh, at night, they would let her out to feed her and stretch her legs and what have you. Well, what his concern was, think about the times now. Uh, you know about the fugitive slave law, which meant if uh, that slaveholders could send out uh, men, uh, like bounty hunters, that would go and find these uh, slaves who had escaped and bring them back into slavery. He wanted, her master wanted her to go to Oregon with them. And he was afraid uh, that some of this would happen because they were, you know, the Oregon Trail was a, it was just like a highway. You know, that's how people were getting to the West. And so it sounds terrible to us now, but that was his way of dealing with this. And it's all in his diary of why he did this to her, and she made it. Not only did she make it across the Oregon Trail in this manner, but she ends up in Salem. Rose Jackson, her story is told at the museum up in Oregon City, the end of the Oregon Trail. If you've ever been up there, take a look around and you will learn all about Rose Jackson up there. This is a little closer to home, Amanda Gardner Johnson, who lived in Albany in the 1850s. She also came across on the Oregon Trail. Her situation was a little different. She had been given as a wedding gift for the couple that was coming to Oregon via the trail. Now, this was not unusual at the time for slaves to be given as gifts because you might recall that back in those days, slaves were property, just like a mule, a cow, a slave. In fact, that's one of the ways you could do some good research <coughs> on African-American history is you go to property records. And if you know the names of those slave owners, sometimes they'll even tell you the names of the slaves. Most often, though, they'll say so many males, so many females. But in certain cases, you can even pick up names uh, from those old slave records, uh, property records, I should say. So she is uh, brought over, given as a wedding gift, 
They make it all the way into uh, Albany. Eventually, she marries a blacksmith. They have a business there in uh, Albany and became uh, productive community members in spite of these laws. I keep saying that because I think that's so important to understand that while we look at this and we say they had laws, the black exclusion laws, black people were still coming, living, surviving, and even thriving in Oregon during that time. Um, let's see, how's my time? Ooh, okay. All right, I'm gonna hurry a little bit. This is a picture of man in Louis Southworth. This is another example of how we know there was slavery in Oregon, uh, because this man who uh, spent a lot of time in the Corvallis area, he had to <coughs> buy his uh, freedom. And one of the ways in which he did that was, I don't know when it shows up there, but yeah, you can see it. You see at the, on top of the clock, there's a fiddle. Sometimes when you read about him, he's called the fiddler uh, because he was a very gifted musician and he would play for churches and dances and wherever he could make money. Uh, and in the end, he earned $1,000 and bought his freedom. So if you didn't have slavery in Oregon, why would he need to buy his freedom? You see what I'm saying? Okay, just the illustration. Now here is another illustration of something that happened in Oregon. Sometimes slaves were told that if you come with us on the Oregon Trail, we're going to Oregon, it's a free state, we'll free you when you get there. In some cases that happened, in some cases it did not happen. In this case, he was free, this man John Livingston, who ends up in Oregon City, not only was he free, but he was given property which would have been very unusual. Remember, in spite of these laws, okay? So he's given property, and he makes the best of it. When you read his obituary, not only did he turn that property into a business, it was like a, a, a timber business, and it said that he had these, uh, uh, what you call it, the carts that came out of the woods there above Oregon City, you know where the bluffs are right there on 99? Um, and back when the uh, sidewalks of Oregon City were first put in, he was bringing uh, wood out of those uh, forests up above Oregon City that helped produce those first sidewalks in Oregon City. So with proceeds from that, again, from his obituary, he owned land in eastern Oregon and also in Salem. So here is a slave. He's brought here. He got what he was promised. He was given his freedom, but he was also given property, which was, you know, that's probably as good as it's going to get for anybody coming here. Uh, this is a local story that a lot of people know about. This is Wiley Griffin. Uh, everybody, let's see, anyone who doesn't know about Wiley Griffin, raise your hand. Oh, okay, quite a few. Well, Wiley Griffin, I'm not going to tell you his whole story, because some of his story is in the exhibit, so you're going to have to find out about that. Plus, there is a marker and a, um, what do you call it, a, a display about him in front of the E-Web building, is that what you call it? I always get it wrong. Okay, there's information about him there, so if you're really interested in him, he was here in the 1880s and he was a trolley driver. Now when I show this to uh, little kids, they say, what is that horse in front of the, the trolley? Because <laughs> when you say trolley and them, they have a whole different picture. Okay. <laughs> but this was the beginning of the trolley system, you know, the rail system in Eugene. So here is this black man right here. He was not a, a, a slave when he was right here. He worked. Now here's another interesting thing I didn't mention early on. I was curious about Marcus Lopez. So he was a slave on the ship? Not that we know of. Because remember we said that these were multicultural crews? They were being paid. So it likely, because he was never mentioned as a slave, and this guy who was taking the notes was very meticulous in how he was described, so likely he was, he was a paid seaman just like the rest of them were. Anyway, kind of an interesting little side note. Okay, um, let's see, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. This is the only uh, white face you'll see in my presentation. 
but he has a very interesting connection with Oregon Black history. His name is Obed Dickinson. He was a Congregationalist minister who was sent out during the era that the Methodists were uh, kind of running the Willamette Valley through the Methodist uh, mission, Jason Lee and that whole thing. Well, he was a Congregationalist minister. He was sent to Salem to establish a church. And when he got there, he found all kinds of things were happening, uh, sinful things, he called them, were happening in Salem that he just could not abide by. So he started preaching against these things from the pulpit. Uh, things like gambling, prostitution, uh, drinking, uh, slavery. In fact, he invited black people that lived in Salem to come to his church. And you know how outrageous that would have been even then. Um, eventually, um, he ends up being the officiant at the marriage of this couple. Now, they were a lot younger then, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it made such a, uh, it was such a big deal that the story about him officiating at their wedding was in the San Francisco newspaper back then. And that was in the 1800s, the late 18, I want to say like 1862, something like that. So again, when you think about the time period when all this was going on in Oregon, while we're knowing what's going on in the South with emancipation and all that, it's, it's like two parallel worlds going on at the same time. Okay, let's see. I'm just going to skip a little ahead. This is kind of an interesting story. This man lived in Canyon City. He had been uh, prosperous during the California gold rush. A lot of people don't recognize or think that there was actually an Oregon gold rush at about the same time. And because he had made some money down in California and found out that there was more money to be had in Oregon, he comes to Canyon, uh, Canyon City and continues uh, what he had started in uh, California because very prosperous. <coughs> Uh, you read his obituaries, you just wouldn't believe something like that was happening out there. I didn't even know where Can the Canyon City was. Uh, but he became a very prosperous man. And this one I like to talk about because uh, most times if people don't think there were black cowboys, they might say, oh yeah, we know about the Buffalo Soldiers. But certainly not in Oregon. Well, Oregon had its own uh, champion bronc rider named George Fletcher. And George is the one on uh, the horse to the right, and he's also the man pictured at the bottom. The other, Jesse Stahl, was also a, a rodeo rider, but we're not sure that he actually, that he might have just been on the circuit. You know how in the rodeo you go from place to place. But we know where George came from. He lived out near that uh, um, Indian reservation, the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And in fact, he, he says that that's how he really uh, honed his skills because a lot of his friends were great writers from the reservation out there. And he becomes one of the first writers at the Pendleton Roundup in 1911, 1912. And if you go out there now to the Pendleton Roundup uh, Museum, there's a lot of information about him there. Not only is he a well known Oregon champion, but he's also in the um, National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. So he's one of those cowboys, black Oregon cowboys, that we can all be very proud of. Not everybody makes that the Oklahoma City uh, Museum, you know, the, has an honor like that. So the kids enjoy this too. Because uh, there's certain things when I'm talking to them that I want to stick in their head. One, and I usually come back at the end and I say, were there any black people on the Oregon Trail? Yes. Remember the lady in the box? Remember this? Remember that? Okay, that's one thing. Are there any black cowboys? Yeah, remember George? You know, so if you don't remember anything else, those are two or three key things that you can remember that will help you to understand that there's a whole history out there. And this is just a real short sampling of it. Um, okay, just a couple more things and we'll open it up for questions. Um, I want to say a little bit about what happened after um, well, really in the 20s or so, because we really can't talk about Oregon history without talking about the Klan, unfortunately. So I'm going to say a few things about that. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that 
uh, with black people being here, uh, they had to pay property taxes, for example, which in theory should go to public schools, right? But in a lot of cases, they were excluded from public schools. And so they weren't able to go, some of them, to school at all, at least in the beginning. There were four instances we know of segregated schools, uh, schools specifically for black children because of this. Uh, one in Portland, one in Salem that happened at about the same time in the 1860s. One out in Vernonia and in Maxville, which is up in the Malawa Mountains. Uh, the, the town no longer exists, but it was a lumber town. Uh, and there's a wonderful museum up there that talks all about what was happening there in Maxville. And uh, actually, if you watch a lot of OPB, years ago there was a story called The Logger's Daughter. And it tells the story of a woman who went in search of her personal history, and she winds up in Maxville and learns all about this segregated town. And it's a very interesting story. Uh, so yes, there were segregated schools. Uh, I'm going to go right to, OK. So I said we can't talk about Oregon Black History without talking about the Klan. The Klan was rampant in Oregon in the 1920s. Um, and a lot of people will say, when I travel around, they say, oh yeah, we know it was really bad in Medford, or it was really bad in Dallas, or it was really, it was really bad all over the state. Because, uh, you know, in most cases, we don't have to go far to find pictures of Klan rallies in almost every major city town in Oregon. This just have, this particular one has to do with Portland. And I bring this here because the Klan got all involved in politics in Oregon. And you know that's an important story to understand too. You had Klan members and Klan uh, affiliations that went all the way to the governor's office. And you know from different things that are going on here on campus and on other campus, there were a lot of key political figures and very influential people who were uh, clan affiliates or sem uh, sympathizers. So this, I thought, was, was great just because of the headline. Chief Cluxers tell law enforcement officers just what Mystic Organization proposes to do in the city of Portland. Isn't that great? <laughs> this is a picture that appears in there, too. And you have to really go in there and take a look at it to really get a sense of how important this picture is because it's hard to see. But this is downtown Eugene. There's Skinner's View. Okay, so we know where we are. And if you look closely there, but if you really look closely yes. in there, we've blown that up. And you'll see there's KKK at the top of Skinner's View and a cross. This was a gathering place for the Klan in the Eugene area during that time. At one time, the Klan in Oregon was the largest, had the largest membership west of the Mississippi. Again, that goes back to this whole idea that Oregon is going to be, or Oregon territory is going to be this white homeland type thing. And so this kind of plays right into that whole feeling and the feeling that a lot of people had coming out of the, the South about the way things should be. So go in there and take a look. You can really see it well in there much better than on this picture. This is something we came across over at the uh, museum that's uh, Lane County Historical. Uh, again, we're digging and trying to find things, and one of the young ladies over there kind of opened this up, and here was a poster that's talking about a Klan rally that's going to take place. And guess where it's going to take place? At the Lane County Fairgrounds. And uh, Lauren, is Lauren still here? Yeah. Okay. And Lauren was with us. Remember when we found that? I do. Yeah, and, and we were like, wait a minute, you mean it was like right here, they were standing where it happened? The answer to that is yes. That's exactly what happened. So this is a, an example, and it wasn't just Eugene. I have to just say that over and over again. We found these same kinds of things at different places all over the state. And um, this is kind of a, uh, a part of that, really. We've used this in an exhibit before. This is a, a man who worked in the shipyards who said he was surprised to see all the signs on Union Avenue. There were white trade only signs. Here's an example of one. We cater to white trade only. Here's another example of one. You can't read it very well from here, but it says colored patronage uh, not solicited. Okay, so it means. 
means you don't need to come in here and looking for a drink. Okay? There were also sundown laws. Everybody know what that is? I say we should be calling these sundown practices because we've yet to find documentation of a city council or a county uh, creating a law as we would think of it. But it was certainly the practice throughout the state of Oregon and in other states as well, which basically said you need to be off the streets by sundown or bad things can happen to you, particularly when you have the Klan involved and other vigilante type groups and Klan sympathizers. Uh, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't difficult to believe that bad things would happen. And in fact, we know of several instances in which the Klan put flyers on the doorsteps of people who lived in Salem, in Eugene, in Portland, uh, you know, encouraging them to get out of town or they were going to get what, you know, what they deserved. And so the Klan here in Oregon did a lot of attempts at intimidating people. And, you know, some of it worked. It's one of the reasons why there aren't a lot of black people in Oregon right now. Some of you may have heard the, the uh, lecture by the woman who talks about that very specifically, why there aren't more black people in Oregon. When you understand the history there and you see that history, you know, down through time, it's a good explanation for that. Okay, let's see. All right, I'm going to stop right there for now. I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Oh, um, let me tell you just about two legal cases, and then we'll open for, uh, okay, we'll open for some uh, questions. There's two very important legal cases that happen around the issue of slavery and blacks in Oregon. Um, one involved, let's see, I think I had a picture of the, yeah. Okay. Remember I said that sometimes families were told if they came to Oregon, once they got here, they would be free. Well, this was an instance, it was a, a man named uh, Robin Holmes, and his wife was Polly, and it's covered in our book, by the way, Perseverance, which is uh, uh, in the gift shop. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so they were told that they had several children. They came with the, their slave master to Oregon, they actually started a little farm out in, in the Rickrails area. However, in the end, they were not all free. The, the man, the wife, and a couple of the children were free. The other children were kept by the slave master. And without going into a whole lot of detail, but it's covered in this book, Breaking Chains, if you, if you want a lot of detail on it. Um, eventually, uh, Robin Holmes sues to get his children back which was, again, unheard of at the time. To find a, a lawyer that was willing to take the case, that was one thing. To find a judge that eventually, uh, um, you know, made a, um, a uh, decision on their behalf, it was kind of unheard of. But um, the interesting thing about that case to me is that they finally won the case, they got the children back, and guess what part of what the judge said in rendering that those children could come back. Well, wait a minute. He can't keep those children as slaves. Slavery is illegal in Oregon. <laughs> you know, it seems simple. It's kind of using those words back into the legal system, which I think is kind of ironic. So that was one. This woman who's here, she was very old at this point. It was 1924 when this picture was taken. She is one of those children that had originally been kept and that then that was set free. And so that's why her picture. Now, you might wonder why she has so many names. She started out as Mary Jane Holmes. She married a man named Reuben Shipley. By the way, there's a whole story about Reuben Shipley and the Union. What is the name of that cemetery? Curry, what's the name of that? Mount Union Cemetery. Shipley ends up, <coughs> excuse me, deeding part, he owned part of that property, which is now that Mount Union Cemetery. He deeded part of that property to the city because he wanted to make sure black people had a place to be buried. So it's a very interesting connection between cemeteries and, you know, that whole case. And then he died and she married a man named Drake, so that's why all those names are on there. <laughs> okay, one other thing, and I'll stop. <clears throat> I'm getting hoarse anyway. There's another important legal case called the Letitia Carson case. 
Um, in fact, I'm going to go to my notes on this. Letitia Carson and her husband, uh, David, who was an Irish man, came over the Oregon Trail. They had a child, a little girl, named Martha. And then first they land in Benton County for a while. And then they end up down in Douglas County. They had, okay, they had another child, a son, uh, down there. And then he died. Now, kind of the interesting part, he applied for the donation land, um, you know, how you could get so much. If you were a married couple, you got double the amount. And so in the beginning, he got 640 acres, okay, which kind of implied that he saw them as being married. Now, we haven't found a a marriage license, but we haven't found marriage licenses on a lot of people, black or white. And during that time period, that was the most important thing going on, you know. But anyway, they saw themselves as a married couple. So he dies, <clears throat> excuse me, and she should have inherited everything that was his. She had been promised that. Uh, but it goes, the, the property and all, it goes to an executor who was one of the neighbors. He sees an opportunity. Wait a minute, we've got these laws on the books. They probably, you know, he was probably her master and she was the servant. Who cares whether they had children and they were operating as husband and wife. So he tries to take that property, and he did, initially. And then guess what? She sues. And guess what? Eventually she gets everything back. So it's a very interesting story. It's a lot more complicated than that, but it, it makes a very interesting reading. A lot of research has been done on this, and reading all of those court records, it's unbelievable when you read, you know, the actual court records of uh, her taking uh, this guy to court and eventually getting her stuff back. Uh, if any of you read um, oh, Jane Kirkpatrick, she has written a book that uh, has to do with that court case, and it's called A Light in the Wilderness. And it's kind of based loosely on that Letitia Carson thing. Uh, Letitia Carson and her son is buried in Douglas County. I had the pleasure a few years ago of going with Jane Kirkpatrick to her gravesite. And so that was very interesting when you really realize how exciting that story was. The thing I wanted to make sure I got right on here, Letitia Carson was an Oregon pioneer and the only black woman to successfully make a land claim in Oregon under the Homestead Act of 1862. Now there's a big fact. That is a big fact. And so it goes on to tell her story. And so this woman, when you read and read about her and you get to know her, you think, man, I mean, here was a very smart woman, a very capable woman. Uh, she learned to live by herself without her husband there, raised these children, became a part of the community, was suing people. I mean, <laughs> she had enough sense to, you know, go for the Homestead Act and all that. So anyway, it's a very interesting story. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions for a few minutes.